So I'm going to use my biface, and I'm gonna start scraping the Amadou. Once I get a fair amount, I will uh, make two piles, one with manganese and one without. And we'll see which one works better at capturing the spark, see which one goes faster. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my piece of manganese and I'm going to uh, scrape it using the biface again, which is our multi-tool, sort of the Neanderthal Swiss Army knife. It's good for everything. Here we go, try it out. After a few minutes of effort. Don't know why it's not taken. Okay. Whew. That one was hard fought, but it's, uh, it's going, got a nice little ember here. I, I kind of lost count after a while, but I mean, this one was a bit tough. It might be the humid, humid air tonight, but I mean, it was certainly, I would say, well over 200. Uh, so um, this one took a little bit of effort, but hopefully the manganese will make it a lot faster and make the process a whole lot easier. Going. So that was noticeably faster. I'm not exactly sure how many that was, but probably more like 50. So um, it seems to, uh, I mean, it's, it's just one experiment, uh, but uh, it hopefully shows that manganese does make this process quite a bit quicker. Ah, whoo, that's how you make fire like a Neanderthal. Huh. When heated, manganese releases oxygen, which facilitates and amplifies combustion. Although Neanderthal man didn't have the scientific explanation for this phenomenon, experimentation and experience taught him the interest in using this mineral. An extra tool, which could be the sign of an already advanced control of fire. You know, we're, we're never going to find the earliest instance of this, this practice. Um, all we can do is sort of chase it backwards in time. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's humbling, it's also exciting. It kind of makes you, it makes you feel powerful to be able to create a fire out of nothing, like inanimate objects that have nothing to do with fire on their own, but when they combine, it's like, you know, it's like one of the, the first syntheses um, that, that humans manage to create is taking these two things to create something completely different. Everybody likes to gather around the barbecue. Everybody likes to sit next to a, a campfire or a, a fire in their uh, fireplace at home. And I think this has a lot to do with the deep um, prehistory of fire use by people. It's sort of ingrained into our nature. We've incorporated it into our psyche. And all of that can be traced back to the first person who figured out that striking a piece of flint with a piece of pyrite is gonna create that spark. And not only did it sort of spark a fire, but it, it, it sparked our, our humanity in some way. A driver of human progress, the control of fire produced a whole host of technological advances. Fire enabled all kinds of transformations, raw to cooked, clay to pottery, sand to glass. This all-powerful ally took man out of the Stone Age and into the Bronze, then Iron Ages. 
The first metals worked by man were those that required fairly low fusion temperatures. It was quite possible to reach these temperatures by blowing strongly on a simple hearth. After that, to work iron and steel, it was impossible to reach the required temperatures of plus 1,300 degrees in a typical wood-fired hearth. Such heat could only be reached in a furnace. So the invention of the furnace was a genuine technological revolution. Deep in the Burgundy region, a forest bears the traces of this revolution. A landscape made up of rocks that look like lava. And yet, there are no volcanoes around here. This strange landscape wasn't formed by nature, but by an ancestral human activity. 2,000 years ago, the Ferrier de Tanner was the biggest metalworking center in Roman Gaul. Blacksmiths constructed a large number of bloomeries, which could produce unprecedented temperatures. They're changing color. Did you fill in all the cracks? Sure. And I added some clay and slurry even on the inside, where the heat cracked it. It's in perfect working order. Wrought iron craftsmen, or simple iron enthusiasts, the members of the Ferrier de Tanner Association are trying to revive the technology of the bloomery. A smelting furnace which extracts the precious iron from rock to provide the blacksmith with the raw material for his craft. It's ancestral technology. We don't know when it dates from, as there are no written records, but we have traces here from Gallo-Roman times. Iron workers discovered this thanks to potters, who used the surrounding rock for their kilns, including copper ore. And they soon realized that as the temperature increased, copper droplets would fall onto their pottery. So they had the idea of doing the same thing with iron ore. A bloomery is a clay pit and chimney, inside which a fire is lit. Once the temperature has risen, it's fed during several hours with successive layers of charcoal and iron ore. As this gradually descends the stack, the charcoal and iron ore heat up until reaching a temperature of 1,150 degrees Celsius, thanks to a constant supply of oxygen through pipes called tuyères. The carbon monoxide released by the combustion of the charcoal removes the oxygen from the ore, allowing iron to collect at the bottom in a spongy mass called a bloom. This is our 15th bloomery, and we still haven't mastered the technique. With each new bloomery, we changed a parameter or two. We're getting results which are improving as we go along. We hope we get there one day. It's not certain, but we hope so. We will get a result, that's for sure. I don't know what result, but there will be a result. To make the bloomery operational, you start by firing it on the outside to harden the clay and force out any air pockets. It's then left to increase in temperature all night long. A vigil haunted by the ghosts of the masters of fire, the blacksmiths of bygone days. There's one figure who stands out, an almost magical being, and that's the blacksmith. The blacksmith was the one who, thanks to fire, 
could extract iron, reveal its secrets, and produced incredibly precious things. On the scale of a small village community, the blacksmith was the one who held that vast power. There are clearly mythological resonances in someone capable of doing such things. It was as if he were inhabited by powerful gods like Vulcan or Hephaestus. Swords, armor, shields, knives, bells, cauldrons, locks, scythes, all the tools of civilization were struck by the blacksmith's hammer. At daybreak, to amplify the increase in temperature, the bloomery is fed charcoal, almost pure carbon. It will burn away with barely a flame thus increasing its heating power. I think you can feed it. I add some more to the charcoal. This is burgundy hematite, which is quite rich in iron. It's a nice looking red ore with hints of brown. And the richer an iron hematite is, it will be a darker brown or even gray. Well then, look. Look, we're nearing the bloom stage. It's nice and soft. It's very good sponge iron. It's not bad at all. It's really not bad at all. The temperature inside is 1,150 degrees Celsius, what we call the forging zone. It's when the metal can agglomerate and become malleable. If the temperature were higher than that, the metal would vanish, because it melts away at 1,400 degrees, and we'd lose it all. And if the temperature is lower than that, the metal wouldn't be malleable. But I wouldn't say we've completely mastered it, because we're still experimenting. We're able to control the fire, but we're still far from being alchemists or magicians. We're just some guys experimenting to try to rediscover the ancestral practices that have sadly been lost over time. During 12 hours, 50 kilos of charcoal and 20 kilos of iron ore will be swallowed up by the bloomery before the blacksmiths of Tanner finally bring down the beast. Drum roll. Stand back a bit. And there's the bloom. There you go. But does the bloom contain the hoped for iron? The magnet will tell all. I have no reaction in these parts. Nothing doing there. Hey, this holds. You can hear the attraction. Here too, the magnet holds. There's iron in there, that's for sure. So it's a small victory. Because for three years, the magnet hasn't done a thing. The trouble is, the droplets of molten iron are spread about. So we've slightly missed out on getting one solid malleable lump. But it's good. It's pretty satisfying. I hope to one day unlock the secret of the Gallo-Romans. Sadly, they're not here to pass it on. But we'll keep going. And I'm confident. <laughs>